My dear brothers and sisters, MashaAllah, we are now at the point where we can hear words of wisdom and advice, not only for the coming month of Ramadan, but to charge us spiritually throughout the coming year. To begin, I call upon our beloved young Shaykh, Imam Suhaib Webb, to address the audience. He's been studying at Al-Azhar, and uh, I personally have a love for him, as I've watched him come, mashallah, and grow into a scholar, and inshallah, he will be among the progeny of this Islamic work, Imam Suhaib Webb. السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ومن ولا It's an honor to be here at ISNA I would like to thank all of our scholars uh, our brothers and sisters, parents, youth, young professionals everyone who made an effort to come here and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make every turn of the wheel and every mile in the air that we spin for his sake. And we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward us greatly for our efforts. What a wonderful event and a wonderful gathering. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the culmination of the prophetic legacy. Al-Anbiya, Ikhwa, wa dinuhum wahid. As he said, alayhi salatu was salam, that the prophets are brothers and that their faith is one. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are two important points to his message which I would like us to take home tonight. It's not enough to be inspired by speeches, but the real legacy of the talks and the convention are going to take place once we get back home, once we go back to work, once our wives make us angry, once our husbands upset us, as we struggle to raise children, as we struggle to be part of the community. Over the course of the next year, what we've heard, what we've learned, the interactions with people, this is going to be telling of what we took away from this important gathering. Number one, the Prophet Wasallam brought an empowering message, a message of empowerment. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, when He describes the Prophet Wasallam in the Qur'an, He uses words which could only lead one to fathom how great, how amazing, how articulate, how in tune, how motivating was the best of creation. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Such that when Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala described him and his actions, he did not use an action to describe his actions. He used a noun. He said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you, O Muhammad. And he didn't say, Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. As Shaykh Ibn Ashur rahimahullah, he mentioned, he didn't say so that you will act as a, as a mercy giver. He said, you are mercy. You embody mercy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used him. وَبِهِ أَحْيَا قُلُوبَ nas, And he brought the hearts of the people to life with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People which Allah described when كَانُوا مِنْ قَبُلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ People who when manifest our, manifest error. And Allah says about this message, أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ The one who is dead and we brought him to life. This was the message of the Prophet ﷺ. An empowering message, a message of transcendence, 
that brought people, as Allah says, ala shafratim min al-nar, who are on the brink of hellfire, fa'anqadakum minha, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from the hellfire with the empowering message of Islam, with the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that takes us into the second important component of the Prophet's message, and that is relevancy. Relevancy. The Prophet وسلم, his message was relevant to his people. And this message, inshaAllah, by the will of Allah and the mercy of Allah, as Allah has promised, will stay relevant until the end of time. But here's a challenge for you. Did the Prophet وسلم, solve the problems of his community only? Did he solve the problems of his community exclusively? Or was he able, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by the Nasr of Allah, to solve the problems of the Arabs, the Muslims and the non-Muslims. He was relevant to such an extent that one of the great enemies of the Prophet wasallam, when he left him and he came back to his friends, he said, Jittu min indi khayri nas. He said, I have just come from the best human being, from the best person. So the Prophet ﷺ did not exclusively solve the problems of his small community in Mecca and Medina, but he brought answers that were relevant to the society as a whole. And that's why the people loved him. And alhamdulillah, at the end of his message, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, people accepted Islam afwaja in great numbers. For that reason, and I will not take much of your time, Institutions like ISNA, institutions like uh, MSA and MINA are extremely important for us to achieve two important things, to be carriers of this message of inspiration, not only to ourselves, but to others. Dr. Sherman Jackson, my Sheikh, he said something today, and I'm sure Imam Zaid and our Sheikh Hamza Yusuf can all attest that we were inspired by the message of Islam and we were inspired by the Prophet Sallallahu such that someone like me who was lost in the bowels of society was brought back to life by the message of the Prophet Sallallahu So number one, we have to be very cautious in America that we do not import a theology of complexes and then try to inject those complexes into the veins of our community as well as the other people who live with us. As one brother came to me, and I've been guilty of this, due to my youth, due to being a little cynical as my mother tells me, and sometimes a little arrogant as one of my teachers tells me. One brother came to me and he said, Imam Suhaib, man, let's talk for a minute. That means let's sit down and talk for a while. He said to me, what's up with you, brother? I said, what do you mean? He said, Ahi, I don't need a theology that tells me about Allah's hand. I don't need a theology that tells me about His arsh. My secretary looks like Beyonce. I need a theology that's going to protect me from that. I need a theology that's going to help me raise my kids. I need a theology that's going to cause me to contribute something positive to society. And what you presented, me, what you presented to me is a theology of complexes, a debilitating theology. But the Prophet wasn't like that. When people came to him, they left inspired, they left committed. They would go to one village by themselves and spread the message of Islam through their character, through their fidelity, through their noble ethics. So we have to be careful that we do not import from the East theological issues and practices which have only created greater complexes in the East itself and try to inject them into the West. Number two is we have to inspire people in our community and give them hope. By Allah, a woman came to me in Northern California a young sister. She met with me last Tuesday. And she said to me, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with this. 
I'm struggling with this. Then she said to me, Imam, am I X'd out? Am I X'd out? Is it over for me? Am I doomed? Is the hell right there? And she began to cry. So I just took the book Riyadh Salihin. And I began to read from the chapter about the mercy of Allah. And she said, I never heard this theology before. I never heard this mercy before. How many of you saw this lost boy here just now? What is one? What is one? Come in. Did you see the look on his face when his father found him? Did you see the look on his father's face when he found his son? When a woman lost her child in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said about that woman, Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. He said, Allah is more merciful to, to his servants than this woman she was to that lost child that she found. So dear brothers and sisters, an important message is we have to be careful of a utopic set of constructs by which we gauge people in our community. As one person said to me, when I go to the mosque, I feel like it's judge duty. But when I go to the mosque, what I need is Dr. Phil. I need pastoring. I need help. I need crutches. I got issues. I have struggles that I'm dealing with. And when I come to the community and face judgment and reckoning before Allah has judged and reckoned me, the only thing I'm going to do, as Sheikh Imam Zayd wrote a very important article, is make flight from the masjid. Hijra from the masjid. So lower the bar. As one sister came to me and said, if Abu Bakr came to my house to marry me, my father would say no for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Lowering the bar for the converts, lowering the bar for those who are struggling. We saw the narrative today of the immigrant community, but what wasn't mentioned with all respect is our narrative, those who are first generation now who accepted Islam. Brothers I know in Oklahoma, an ex-drug dealer and gang member who used to drive every day one hour to memorize the Book of Allah. One hour to memorize the Qur'an. My friend who was a DJ with me, Mujahid, who became Muslim, Alhamdulillah, used to ride a bike to Fajr 20 minutes every day. Those struggles are also part of this narrative. They cannot be, be erased, cannot be forgotten. Women who become Muslim and are married to non-Muslim men and struggle with that. So we have to be careful, very careful, that we are relevant and we understand. As Allah said, فَاسْتَقِيمُوا إِلَيْهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا Allah says, be upright and this wow wow ma'iyah. And at the same time that you're upright, seek Allah's forgiveness, seek Allah's mercy. We can no longer be an insecure community which bases itself on unrealistic theological constructs. Because theology is to deal with reality. Spirituality is for reality. But if we're crippling the sinner and crippling the one who struggles, before they can even come to the community, wallahi, we failed. We failed. And you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A drunk man in Sahih Bukhari goes to the mosque of the Prophet. How many drunk people will come to me? People even who use shisha won't come to me. What about someone who's drunk? What about people who are struggling? Struggling for this relationship with Allah. As the ulama said, which the hearts desire more than food and drink. We have to be a passageway. We have to be like dhimmies, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, relevant and accessible as imams and leaders of communities to the masses, to the masses, to the masses, without charging them a lot of money. We have to be there for our communities. We cannot distance ourselves from the communities because they're struggling. And if they struggle and they're distant from us and we condemn them for that, then we should be blamed twice. Accessibility and relevance to society. And that brings us to the last point under that, and that is the young. We've seen a 9-11, I consider it a social aneurysm in our community. Let's be honest, before 9-11, the rhetoric was almost borderline leftist in our community. There was a very anti-American, at times, rhetoric. After 9-11, next to the dish, we found the American flag. 
because we were forced to reconcile with our own demons, to deal with our own demons and realize that perhaps we had become an attempt out of our love for the Prophet, we become even more extreme than what Islam asked of us. And that created what? Great, a great, great gap between us and the people. My mother, my mother is a non-Muslim. If you are out at 5.30 at night in my neighborhood, and you're the son of Mary Lynn Webb, she will come and find you in her car and take you home. At dinner time, if you don't pray, you're getting punished. You have to wear a shirt. My mother ironed our clothes. She cooked. We don't go out to eat. That's an ebb. This is a non-Muslim woman. How is it that till now, our message is not relevant to the non-Muslim community around us? And in fact, we're struggling to make it relevant to the Muslim community. I envision a day, and I hope for a day, where we see non-Muslims here. Because we offer solutions to their problems. And I've encountered this. I've encountered Islamic schools where a large number of children enrolled in those Islamic schools are non-Muslims. And you ask parents, why? And they say, ethics, values, respect. I don't want them to be Muslim. But your community is giving something to me. So as I finish tonight, I challenge you to do a few things. Number one, many of you came together from communities. On the way home, you should develop some type of think tank apparatus in your community which will diagnose one problem that affects the whole community that your community can serve. Young Muslims come to me and say, MashaAllah, brother, we're praying in high school. Brother, you have to pray in high school. It's like a brother who goes to his wife and says, MashaAllah, sister, MashaAllah, sister, I got you a house and I'm taking care of your food and your medicine and your car. She said, brother, where's the extra jibab? You have to do that. But what I would like to see are high school students who address the drug problem in North America. High school students who are going to give backpacks to the poor people in their neighborhood and offer supplies to young children that will last them for one year. Start a Head Start program which was amputated from the budget of this federal government in 2001-2002. Go and teach young people how to read. Because the first verse, first verse sent in the Quran is Iqra. Be relevant. Be a solution. Don't ask what Isna can do for you, but what you can do for Isna. Don't ask what Islam is going to do for you, but what are you going to do for this deen? So number one, you go back to your community, and this will be a proof for you against you. Have a study of the community, sorry, and develop answers for those communities that you live in. Number two, as a family, start a weekly halaqa in your house. A weekly halaqa with your wife and children. Read a verse of Quran, some hadith. You'll find Allah will put wallahi with the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If Allah brought light to those dark hearts of those lost Arabs, He'll bring light into your home by Allah. Number three, before you leave here tonight, find someone that you don't know. Find someone that you've never met before in your life. Say assalamu alaikum and exchange emails. Stay in touch with each other for one year. Get to know each other for one year. Because brotherhood and community needs cultivation and investment. I ask Allah to bless all of you. And I have a great hope for this community. Insha'Allah, I came, I'm an example, I'm a proof of the excellent legacy of Isma the excellent legacy of those people who came before us, the legacy of my American brothers and sisters like Sheikh Hamza, Sheikh Zaid Shakir, and others who inspired us as Americans, Dr. Jackson, to not only succeed in the academic world, but to go overseas and study and come back and translate this religion to our society. I ask Allah to bless all of you, and I ask Allah to unite us with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi الله أكبر تكبير جزاك الله خير